each of you this morning to the house of the Lord. And I greet you in Jesus' name. For he is our Savior and our hope and our salvation. And I greet you with open arms because he loves us and we should love each other. gather together as a group of people, not being perfect, but a people, a group of God's children who are striving to become more righteous, live closer to God, and seek his direction in our lives in an effort to assist in the building of the kingdom of God here on earth, even Zion. It is truly my desire and the desires of my brother this hour that your heavenly father is praised and glorified and that the things you hear this day will draw you closer to your heavenly father, that you might seek him out in your private places and in your daily lives so that your countenance might be changed. For it is his desire this day that you receive the bread of life. It is all my brother's desire to serve you in humility and meekness. I'd like to share with you as a call to worship this morning from the 12th chapter of Romans, and it reads as follows. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. And I want to share one more verse. It's out of Matthew. The fifth, the fifth chapter, starting with the 16th verse. For this is what we are called to do this day. Verily I say unto you, I give unto you to be the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Behold, do men light a candle and put it under a bushel? Nay, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Therefore, let your light so shine before the world that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven.
Our Father who art in heaven, come to you at this time to ask a prayer of invocation upon this service. Praying, Father, that our hearts will be softened and our ears will be open to the words that our brother is going to bring to us today. Pray, Father, that change to better sanctify our lives, to better serve Thee. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Our monthly theme is We Thirst for Righteousness, and today's theme is An Offering of Righteousness. <clears throat> and the uh, theme helps directed and suggested that we might read from Malachi. So <clears throat> I've chosen the uh, recommended scriptures of verses uh, of chapter 3, verses two and three, but I'd also like to read number one as well. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, Lord who, whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto him, unto the Lord, an offering in righteousness.
It's good to be with you, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> you know, this has been said so many times, but I find the things that, that have been said so many times before get repeated because they're true and because they have merit. And I tried to explain that to the young men in my class this morning, that a lot of these sayings you hear are old. And if you look at them and you examine them, <clears throat> you'll find a lot of them come from the scriptures and that the reason they've survived is because they're true. Things that are a lie have a tendency to be shown as a lie eventually. And we see the truth and we forget about the lie. I mean, uh, it doesn't do us any good to completely forget about them. I'd hate to want to go back to thinking that the world was flat, but at one time that was accepted as the truth, and now we know that the world is a sphere. It never ceases to amaze me how, how mankind can find it so hard to believe that God created what we see in perfection, in perfect perfection, they can't believe that because that's too far-fetched for them. I watched something on TV this last week, and, and, and I just had to laugh. It was so preposterous that someone would choose to believe that and not believe the scriptures. But some scientists were led to believe that seeing how the, the moon is the absolute perfect diameter it's the absolute perfect distance from the earth that it has a positive effect on the earth. It controls our tides. It does all sorts of things that help regulate the earth. And that that size and that perfect space isn't by accident. Well, we know it's not by accident. It's by design. But they don't believe that God did that, that it was created that way. They have a much more believable scientific answer and that they have proven in their mind beyond a shadow of a doubt that the the moon is a spaceship it's hollow and they had all sorts of reasons to say that it's hollow they could they'd done experiments when certain craft had hit on there and they had sensors in there said that the moon reverberated for so many hours after something landed all these things because it was brought into that place by aliens and they use it as a spaceship. I mean, to me, that just seems preposterous, R ridiculous. Uh, are they right? I can't prove that they're right or wrong, but I know in my mind's eye, the Lord's creation and perfection put us here for a reason. It's not by an accident or some alien driving a spaceship that made this earth where man could inhabit it. I just don't, I don't buy that. So for what it's worth, it just never ceases to amaze me how people can believe something like that and, and try to stack up all sorts of data to prove that they're right, but they can't believe that there's an all-knowing righteous, loving God that created all this and that he put man here for a reason. They choose foolishness. The earth is flat. I mean, it's the same, in my opinion, the same kind of nonsense. The Lord does work in mysterious ways. As I was trying to put my time in order, last week, not this week that we're still in, this Sunday, but last week, Friday, about that Thursday or Friday of that week, I was concerned on what was I going to bring today? What, what was the Lord going to urge me to look at? And I hope that he does urge me because if I just do it on my own, I know it's not going to be much good for anybody. But I believe the, the Lord 
put a bunch of things in place and, and gave me opportunity to study for this, to understand for this, and hopefully make it beneficial for all of us. But I was supposed to start work at my new job last Monday. But things didn't work out quite the way they thought they would. The paperwork didn't get there in time, and it was becoming a bit of a, a challenge for uh, the people at City Hall to get everything in a row. And they, they called me up on Thursday and said, uh, hey, we got all the paperwork back. Everything's golden. Uh, would it be OK if you started on the 31st? I said, that's not a problem. Uh, What's up? He said, well, we can't get it processed through City Hall quick enough to get the payroll and everything straightened out so that it'll work out right. Can you go start on the 31st? I said, yeah, I'm asking. That's not a problem. I said, as a matter of fact, it makes my life a little easier. And he just kind of chuckled. And, and this has been such a long process, t t t all the paperwork and all the things and the tests and the it's, it's weeks in the, in the making here. Longer than that, really. But uh, I, I think he was surprised that I said, yeah, that's okay. I got no problem with it. In fact, I got something I want to do. This has been a, uh, since I left my job at Menards, I've been trying to do all sorts of work around the house that hasn't been done for 20 some odd years. Uh, working on a garage, working on a shed, working on all the stuff that just gets away from you because you're too busy working, living life. So as soon as I got that message that, hey, you're off next week, the little wheels started turning in my mind, and I'm thinking, you know what? It's awful hot down here. Man, it's brutally hot. It's been 100, close to 100 degrees. And I'd go outside and work, and I would work until I was soaking wet. And then I'd start feeling kind of weak, and I'd think, you know what? I'm going back in the air conditioning. I'd just about dry out. And then I'd go back out there again. And then you come back out, and you get soaking wet, and you come back in. It's just a never-ending process of being worn slick, you know, and the heat and the chiggers and all this stuff that's out there. I just had enough. I thought, you know what, I know a place where it's nice and cool. I know it's a place that, that John really likes to go. So we decided we're going to go up to Minnesota. And we drove up to Minnesota. And that's one of those things where I spend more time in the car than I do anywhere else <laughs> doing that. But it's worth it. For the small amount of time that we actually get to go to the places we want to look at, visit with the folks that we love, that, that love us, to, and have that nice communion, that, that interaction. It works about out to be just about as much time as you spend in that car. I'm tired from driving, but uh, it was well worth the effort. We went up there, had a nice visit, but something we try to do, I mean, I don't know about you folks, but in, in my family and in Jonah's family, the dad had some jobs to do, the mom had some jobs to do, and I'm sure it's the same in your families. In my situation, the dad always drove, just the way it was. Mom controlled the kids, made sure we had something to eat, drink, whatever, took care of all the mischief that was going on in the back seat. But dad drove, mom kept everything in control. Well, that's kind of the way it works for us, too. I drive. John, I make sure I've got all the Here's a drink, here's something to nibble on, and here's, you know, stay awake. Well, the staying awake part's hardest of everything. Uh, I always can have something to drink, always can have something to nibble on. But man, that, you're behind that wheel for six, eight hours, 10 hours out of a day. It's hard to keep your eyes from just going closed. So we've got a, a, a thing that we've worked out over the years that works real well. She'll read to me, and she, she finds good books that she reads to me. And this book that we read this time, <clears throat> we read most of it on the way up there and back, and I finished it on my own after that, the last few chapters. It was called Killing Jesus. Excellent book. I'd recommend it to anybody. But it's not for the squeamish. It's, it's, a, it's a book that it's almost horrifying at times when you, when you read some of the things that took place some of the abominations and the, and the horrific sin that took place. But what I found so encouraging, what I found so mysterious in, in God's ways is that that book laid a foundation for the scripture that we're studying here in Malachi. 
I mean, I'd suggest that when you go home today, read the whole book of Malachi. It's all three pages. It's not going to be a long read. But man, is it full of a whole bunch of things that were taking place. Now, this killing of Jesus started from prophecies and things that happened before Jesus got here and when Jesus got here and his death and resurrection. But Malachi, and if we all know our scriptures real well, at the bottom of Malachi it says, and this is the end of the Old Testament. So if there's a, a book that's prepping you to go into the New Testament, it is Mal Malachi. There's a reason that it's written the way it's written, and it's placed where it's placed. That's wisdom. That's divine intervention there. And the reason I say that is we read this book, Killing Jesus, and it, it's going on and taking place and showing how we got to Malachi, and then Malachi, and then after Malachi. So it's right in the same time frame of what I'm, I want to try to discuss today. You know, we've heard Malachi used many times in before an offering, offertory. I've heard it so many times and I kept thinking, you know, one of these days I'm going to really research that, look that out real hard and make sure that we're, we're not taking a piece out of it and maybe misusing it to some degree. Because that happens from time to time. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll like the way the words flow off of our tongue. It says what we want to hear at that time. But if it's taken out of context, it may not be exactly what it was intended for. I want to read a, a little bit more. I'm going to start at uh, reading 4, 5, and 6. And that says, Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in days of old, as in former years. And I will come near to you, and I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against the false swearers, against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Let's read a little bit more here. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the, all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now that's the part we've heard a lot of times used before offertory. And it's fitting because uh, we can still rob God in our tithes and offerings. But this was written for a very specific reason. This was written very timely at reason. This was written very timely and real good on the backs of the people. The Levites the priests that were in the Holy of Holies doing the sacrifices, doing all of these things, they were corrupt. They'd lost their way. They were giving tainted sacrifices. Remember when Jesus came in to the temple and he overturned the table of the money changers, drove out, released the doves, had, there was cattle running all over the place and he drove it all out of that area. The money changers knew that the people had to t pay a tax on anything they did and the only tax you could pay had to be in Roman money. Now the Jews had their own money so they had to exchange it. There comes the money changer part. So you take your money to the money changer 
you expect if a dollar's worth a dollar, you're going to get a dollar of another man's. They didn't do that. Money changers were bilking everybody. They were taking money. You also had to buy sin offerings, peace offerings, things like that. So you're buying cattle. You're buying doves. You're buying all these things. And there was a requirement that the Lord put on these Levites and said, they will be spotless. They will be perfect. There will be no blemishes on them. Well, guess what? They were selling tainted sacrifices. So now poor Joe, trying to be obedient Hebrew, goes to buy his dove. He gets up there at the time of offering, and it's got spots on it. They go, this one isn't any good. I'm not going to sacrifice it for you. Go buy another one. Well, he just spent all the money he had and got built by the money changers, so he can't even have a sacrifice. Or they just turn around, okay, it's a dove. It's got some spots on it. Who cares? Boom, snap its neck. It got casual, nonchalant. They were offering lame sheep, goats, lambs, lamb. They were halt, lame, blind. Those were not things that were pleasing to the Lord. And there's where he says, you know, I'm going to have to purge, come down here and clean. I'm going to have to purge them as gold and silver. He was talking about the people in authority of the church, the people who were in high places, the people who had the responsibility of tending the flock, the human flock, and they had gone astray. That's why all this leading up to Jesus, and when Jesus came in, that's what he was working against. These were the people who were out to get him. They didn't want to upset the apple cart. They were living large, right? They were getting everything they needed, except they weren't doing what God told them to do in the way he told them. So he has to tell them that, look, I'm going to have to purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. He's going to have to take away their sin because they're doing things wrong. Well, in this book that we read, it told this balancing act that had to be held up by the Roman people that were in charge, you know, the pilot, all the other people that were playing in that part, and Caiaphas, because his job was to make sure there wasn't anything that got out of control that looked bad to Rome. So Jesus coming in there was going to disrupt this whole thing. He's going to be the king of the Jews. He's going to get rid of the, he's going to purge the sons of Levi. He's going to clean out that temple. All those people are threatened. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, all these people who have built themselves up into these positions of authority where the people revered them and they were abusing the people. Jesus called it on, called them on, you know, brood of vipers. You know, here you are, you're, you're down here, you're putting burdens on people that don't belong there just so you can feel important and you don't do anything to lighten those burdens or make the life easier for the flock. So these people are all trying to get rid of Jesus. And, and we can look at this and, and history shows us that the Romans killed Jesus, right? They flogged him, scourged him, put him on a cross, stuck a spear into his side, let the blood and the water come out. The Romans actually did that. But when you look at this, the complex steps and events that took place to get that to happen, Rome, Pilate didn't want to do that. Remember, he, he washed his hands of it. Yeah, there's a big play going on there, and there's all sorts of things with people trying to look good. But the reality of it was he didn't want to do something that might get him in trouble. And the way Jesus was crucified, the way that the steps that they took actually broke Roman law. So they had to kind of keep this stuff. It was all pressed into a, a time frame that things had to happen so quickly that Jesus was actually crucified because Caiaphas and the people he'd assembled with him there at that presentation to Pilate called for him to be crucified. 
Pilate had already scourged him. He wanted to turn him loose, right? He says, we're at this Passover, and you have, we have an option to release one criminal and let him go. Would you have me release Jesus? No. We want Barabbas. Barabbas, a guy who was a murderer. He was a maniac. He, he incited riots. But they chose this group of people who had a vested interest chose to have Jesus crucified. And that's when Pilate goes, I'm washing my hands of this. It's on you. You, you make the call. But he was completely content after he sent him to somebody else to try to push the burden off on, on someone else that came back to him. He was ready to just get that whole thing over with, scourge Jesus. And he said, don't kill him. Scourge him. You can come right up to the moment of death, but don't kill him. He's got to die on that cross. And he was ready to turn Jesus loose. So did the Romans really force that murder? Not even. It was the church that did that. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I'd never thought of it that way before. The first time Jesus is, is beat on with, with a robe over his head and say, hey, prophesy this, prophesy who hit you. That wasn't even the Romans doing that the first time. The first time that happened, that was Caiaphas's henchmen, church authority that was beating on Jesus. So I'm going to say the church at that time had gone so far off the mark that it forced Jesus to be crucified. Now, it was going to happen. You know, Jesus prayed three times in that garden. Lord, if, if, if there's any way we don't have to do this, take that cup away from me. Lord, please give me the strength for this. Lord, I sure wish that we didn't have to do this, but thy will be done. Three times did he ask. I find it amazing that through history we've forgotten that the people that Jesus came to save, the people that, that God had given authority to reign over the flock had actually turned away from God and became an impediment to God helping mankind. But that's happened through history. We've seen it in church and functions and, and uh, governments from that time all the way down through till today. And we don't seem to learn from past mistakes and that's sad. You know, when we talk about a righteous offering you know, offerings, they used to have all different kinds of offerings. And, and it wasn't a person making the offering. Remember, it was the Levites that, that did these things. So if there was something went wrong in the middle of it, they were in the middle of it. But there used to be all different kinds of, of uh, offerings that presented to God as an atonement for sin or as a return of thanks for his favors or for other religious purposes, a sacrifice, an oblation. And in the Mosaic economy, there were burnt offerings, sin offerings, peace offerings, trespass offerings, thank offerings, wave offerings, and wood offerings. Even pagan nations also present offerings to their deities. But Christ, by the offering of himself, has superseded the use of other offerings, all other offerings, having made atonement for all men. One time, for all, not just for the people in this room, but for everybody who's willing to accept that offering. Now, that's hard to understand, isn't it? When you, when you watch the news and you, you see that history kind of repeating itself. You know, in Cuba, back when I was a young child going to school, I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I remember how terrifying that was. And, and I mean the whole nation was on edge. And it was brinksmanship, saber rattling to the brink 
of nuclear war. You'd think that in our time, our lifetime, we'd never see that kind of thing happen again because nuclear war is basically all consuming. You're not gonna have one little bomb blow up and it's gonna be a whole bunch of them going off and it's gonna be out of control pretty quick. But we've got a, a situation now on the Korean Peninsula that's just as volatile as Cuba was. You had a maniac shooting off ICBMs and shooting them up high enough to prove that, you know what, I can hit Alaska. I can hit Hawaii. And now it's looking like maybe the West Coast. So we fly B-1 bombers over and say, yeah, we can drop bombs on you too. It's this brinksmanship that, that we haven't outgrown. And you'd hope that mankind would get enlightened in some way, shape, or form as we go through history, but we're not going to. Scriptures tell us this is, this is what's going to happen. Mankind is out of control. Righteousness. We need to understand what righteousness really is. So I'm going to read a couple of definitions. Purity of heart and rectitude of life. Conformity of heart and life to the divine law. Righteousness as used in scripture and theology, in which is chiefly used, is nearly equivalent to holiness. Comprehending holy principles and affections of heart and conformity of life to the divine law. It includes all we call justice, honesty, and virtue, and holy affections. In short, it is true religion. In perfection, in, in applied to God, the perfection or holiness of his nature is exact rectitude and faithfulness. And rectitude means being correct in judgment and procedure. The active and passive obedience of Christ by which the law of God is fulfilled. Justice, equity between man and man. The cause of our justification. You know, the writer of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, but there's people who argue, argue that, historians, <clears throat> but it sure sounds like Paul's writing to me when I read it. <clears throat> or someone who was definitely influenced by. Uh, Hebrews 10, starting at uh, verse 4, going out to 10, and then 14 to 22, um, says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and, and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will... We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. And then picking back up at 14. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living day which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The faults of the natural man were overcome once and for all by Jesus Christ. With the blood of the lamb and the lives of doves and all the other sacrifices couldn't accomplish, the body and blood of Jesus Christ was able to accomplish. He was the perfect high priest capable of making a holy, righteous sacrifice 
that was done properly by a clean vessel in accordance with God's will. As Jonna and I read that book of the depravity, the things that took place in these people that were in charge at that time, the Roman people, Tiberius and Pilate and all these other people that were played a part in this leading up to Christ coming and, and cleaning out the, the church and reestablishing reestablishing the church the way it should be with, with a, a perfect high priest, with him being the one who makes the sacrifice and the offering. There were so many things in there that, that when John read them, I couldn't believe them that, that the world was that ripe with iniquity at that time. But it was. I mean, it's easy. I mean, they had, the Romans were complete maniacs. They did everything for pleasure, whether it means sacrificing people or feeding Christians to lions, whatever it was. They were, they were about as bad as it could get. But some of the things that, that, that the author of that book put in there shocked me. It's as bad as, as bad as we see the worst today, where children are being molested, where children are being killed, where people are being used and thrown away for entertainment. You know, the, the scriptures tell us about will be, the earth will be cleansed with fire be, when it becomes ripe with iniquity. And in my mind's eye, I find it hard to believe that it could get any more ripe than it was at that time or that it is at this time, but I'm afraid that it will. It's, uh, it's tragic. It's sad. The scriptures say it's going to be that way, so I believe it's going to be that way. You know, I'm working with my young men in, in the Sunday school class, and I'm trying to get them to understand that when they go to these retreats, these camps, these things, that it's, there's a reason behind that. It's not just to go have what a friend of mine, a good Christian friend of mine used to refer to as a holy huddle, where you all go out there and you feel real good with each other and, and you, you build yourself up and you come back and you go into society and go right back to the way you were. You basically, the, the mountaintop experience is quickly followed by the reality of coming back into this sin-sick world. And it takes those mountaintop experiences to, to build us up enough to be able to deal with that. I understand that because the world is forced down our throat daily, continually. But I'm trying to get them to understand that when you go to these mountaintop experiences, when you go to these events, when you come back, there's a reason for that event. And it's to build your testimony. Don't all of us as grown-ups have a testimony? Probably numerous testimonies. And I tried to explain to them, look, your testimony has to be able to reach someone who knows nothing about the scriptures. A friend who, who may come to you and say, man, my life is terrible. My family fights all the time. It, it feels like we all hate each other. It feels like there's no love, no compassion. There's something wrong. But I look at you and and you seem to be happy. You seem to have some kind of glow about you. You seem to roll with the punches. You seem to have a positive outlook. And that is the time that you have an opportunity to share a testimony that might save someone's life. <clears throat> the point I tried to tell the boys is that young men that we don't know what effect our testimony is going to have it may be nothing more than a testimony for ourselves to encourage us to keep going getting up when you're knocked down when the world seems to be so much stronger than you are to find the strength through the holy spirit to get back up one more time to try to do what's right 
I'm trying to get them to where they could present a testimony in a way that it would be able to convince someone who knows nothing about the scriptures that there's worth in studying the scriptures. That there's the reason that my life is the way it is, the good things you see come from what I believe. The guy who's struggling and, and feels like there's no hope left, he's struggling because that's what he believes. There is no hope left. And you have to be able to give that person hope. How do you give them hope? You, if you can explain what it feels like to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit, that comfort. I challenged the young men and I said, what does it mean to be under the Spirit? Because that's always what I hear when I come back from this. Oh, the Spirit was great. Okay, to a non-Christian, what does that mean? Now, I try to keep it as light as I can in there to him, and I try to be as worldly as possible and say, well, does that mean you were under the influence of alcohol? You know, those are spirits. Is that what you mean? Obviously not. But that might be the response you get from somebody who's of the world. Oh, no, no, that's not what the spirit means. The spirit is, well, I can't explain it. But when it's on you, you'll know it. Well, what does that give to anybody? What kind of impetus is that to make a change in your life? You'll know it when you feel it. Uh, that's like explaining to somebody, when your hand gets crushed with a hammer, it's going to hurt. Well, I don't know what hurt means. Well, stick your hand out there and I'll crush it with a hammer. You'll know it when you feel it. Foolishness. We've got to be able to put words, put into words what that Holy Spirit feels like. And I kept playing this fool every time they would say something so that I could get them to, to use words other than the words we normally use in our community. In our church, when somebody says you're under the spirit of the influence of the spirit, we know what that means. When somebody says, oh, it was a great spirit, we know what that means because we've had the Holy Spirit on us. But to somebody who has never experienced it or doesn't know what that feeling is, we need to be able to put it in a way they understand. I started pressing them. Well, that one doesn't really mean much. You're talking about, you're using words that we use here in church. The guy who doesn't go to church isn't going to know what that word means. Jack gave one of the best descriptions in that it feels warm and cozy. It does. And I said, yeah, you know what it feels kind of like? Like when you're a little kid and you fall and you scratch your leg and you got a owie on there and you run to your mom and she puts a band-aid on it and she kisses it and it feels better. Now you and I know that that kiss and that band-aid didn't make anything feel better. What you felt was love. You felt comfort. You felt warm and cozy. That is a description that somebody can understand. Josh came up with one, said, you know, the Holy Spirit came on me and convinced me. He made me aware of the fact that I need to be a better, good, big brother to my little brother Joe. He said, I was made aware that the way I treated him wasn't the way I should treat him and that I should treat him better. That's the Holy Spirit. That's how it touched him. Jake said, when I got in this group of people, we feel comfortable together. It's like we're, we're all in harmony. And in the scriptures, as touching one thing. We all have different testimonies. But they have to be able to be translated and put into use by someone who doesn't have the same experience we have. What good is a testimony if everybody keeps it to themselves? I told him, so you go have a great testimony and, and you, you just keep it to yourself. Does that, that's like the guy who was given a talent and buried it in the dirt. And when he's done, gives it got back to God and says, here's your talent. I saved it. It never got damaged. He's going to say, whoa, you wasted that talent. Let me give it to this guy over here who shared that talent with everybody. I told him, I said, I have my own testimony. 
everybody has their own testimony, because if you don't have a testimony about this being true, why would you continue to keep going through these motions? But that testimony is not for me. It, it was for me. But the more testimonies you get, why do you keep getting them? Once I believe in God, I'm not going to unbelieve it. All right? Like saying, once you let the genie out of the bottle, it's out. I believe in God. I'm going to believe in God up to the time that I'm no longer. But I shared a testimony with them and said, guys, I've heard God call my name. Wake me out of a pure sleep. Nobody else in the house but Jonna, and I know her voice, and it wasn't her voice. That voice said, Dennis. And I woke up. I didn't know what, 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 is, what does that mean? My name is being called. Well, even at the bare minimum, it testifies to me that God knows my name. And he called me personally by name and woke me up. For what? I'm still struggling trying to find out. I keep showing up. I keep trying. Not long after that, he said something else to me. And it's relevant. Three words. Not much longer. What does that mean? today's society and the shape of the world, I think it means not much longer. But at the time it was said, it could have mean many things. I had a cousin that I'd just reconnected with at that time. And I was trying to get him to reconnect with his brother. He and his brother had a falling out. Little did I know, and I told Greg this, I said, Greg, I don't know how long I'm going to be around. I said, because I was told, I was awakened from a sleep with the words, not much longer. And I took it to be, it was me. I didn't have much longer. Okay, I'm okay with that. Price has been paid for me. But my cousins, not so much. I don't think they're really Christians. And I tried to convince my cousin Greg, I said, Greg, you need to to work with the any to work this out. And I said, and, and I will too if you want me to. Well, the not much longer was for Greg. He's gone now. He died of cancer. Didn't even know he had it. I didn't know he had it. The way we found out is my dad and I were coming back from a fishing trip or something. And I told him, I said, hey, on your way home, why don't you go stop and talk to Greg? Just catch up. Haven't seen, heard from him for a while. He called me up that night. Hey, I got some bad news. I said, what? He says, Greggy died. Not much longer. Now, that was for me. But those words ring true today. A voice talked to me in the middle of the night. And some people will say, you're just crazy, Dennis. There's something wrong with you. you. We've always thought you were a little strange, but you're crazy. I couldn't argue. I got to say, yeah, I stand as accused. But I'm telling you, that voice shook my being. No person's ever said a voice like that that could resonate in here and wake me out of a dead sleep. And not only just feel it here, but hear it. Not only hear it, but feel it. There's a difference. Tinkling cymbals, we hear those all day long, don't we? Yak, 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 yak. We don't hear them. We hear some chatter, but it doesn't do something. When something gets inside your bosom and resonates, you hear it. You feel it. All this work that we do, all these things that we try to do, this trying to teach our children, trying to impact the community, these are all things that we're doing that are sacrifices. A sacrifice means you're giving up something to do something else. So we choose to sacrifice. 
when there is no real effort put into it, is it really a sacrifice? And I go back to the widow's mite. One guy's throwing buckets full of money into that coffer, but he's got so much money that's nothing. And the widow comes up and sacrifices, because that's all the money she's got, but she puts it in there. Now, that's a sacrifice. The other guy, there's no sacrifice involved in that. It was all a show. I'd have people blow trumpets before they'd do it so everybody would see it going in there. The effort that we put in, the hard work that we put in, the sacrifice that we do, that is a righteous offering to God. And it's kind of been reduced down since, God, since Jesus took care of all the sin offerings, <clears throat> wave offerings, all those things. About the only thing left that we have that goes right back and comes full circle <clears throat> and ties back into Malachi, <clears throat> excuse me, is we're offering a thank offering. Think about that. <clears throat> when we give our tithes, our offerings, our oblations, however you want to call it, whatever you want to look at it as, when you put those things into that basket, that is a thank offering. But the only thing we can offer God anymore. Like Brother Tom said, quoting those scriptures, our body is supposed to be a living sacrifice, right? We can sacrifice our time, our efforts, our decisions. But about all we can really pay back is our thank offering and our efforts that we put in as we testify to others, as we reach out to those people who don't know the gospel or have heard it but don't believe it. But when that opportunity arises, we need to have our, for lack of a better terminology, have your ducks in a row. Think about that testimony. I'm working with these young men so they can polish a testimony so that when the opportunity arises, they'll be able to talk to a guy who doesn't know our language and put it in his terms so he can feel it. I explained when they said, well, what does the Holy Spirit feel like on you? I said, it feels like a lot of different things. Sometimes it's like Jack says, it's that warm, cozy spirit. Another time, it felt like electricity running from my feet to the top of my head, but like good electricity. When you get a hold of electricity and it's bad, it, it's got your attention, but it feels bad. It's not good. But I had the Holy Spirit on me one time that got my attention, and it was from top to bottom, energy flowing through me that it seized me up. I didn't even know what to do. I was standing right up here, and I didn't even know what to say or, or to say, Lord, do with me as you please. I seized under the pressure. It was so overwhelming. So it can feel like a lot of different things, can't it? It can feel like a communion body. We come together and we have that peace, that oneness. It can feel like power coursing through your veins. It can feel like you've got my attention because I felt you vibrate my body from my ears into my soul can be a lot of different things, but your testimony is your testimony, and it isn't yours to hang on to. Remember what you say about, do you hide it under a bushel, or do you put it out there for people so they can get some light from it? As a testimony about the Holy Spirit light, you bet it is. That is light. It shines light into somebody else's light in their life where it's dark. Well, brothers and sisters, I don't, I'm sorry, I got a little a little bit long-winded there, but I do believe that the Lord has placed those things on my heart this week. And just to make sure that I wouldn't make all sorts of stuff up, just read Malachi. See what it has to say. See if those folks didn't take a left-hand turn and go off the deep end. And that's why Christ had to come set things right. He put things in order. He salvaged us from ourselves. He cleaned up the church put it back in order, and it's our job to take that good news to the world. God bless you.
<clears throat> I had something else planned, but uh, one of the last points that Dennis made in his sermon made me kind of switch something around. I'm going to pick up where he left off with the, uh, well, not where he left off, but one of the last points he made with the sacrifice, because that's what we've been talking about for the last hmm, eight weeks or so, a while. And I was telling Zaya last night when I was looking, in, looking more into the, uh, the theme, it's the finale of that. It's the, it's the culmination of what we've been talking about and what that means. And when I first read it, I was just, I was sort of not surprised, but I was like, okay, how does that tie in? And then I thought about it, and then I read through some of the material, and then I found it more material, and I found that it actually worked really well. And the theme is, and they had all things in common. And I had a few scriptures I wanted to read, but I'll, I think I'm going to pare it down a little bit here <clears throat> and just bring you one from Acts chapter 4, verses 31 through 35. And, and this is, yeah. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And after I read that and after I heard what it was just echoed by the ending of the sermon was that we're all called to sacrifice and we're all called to, to, do, to do things. If whether that's to give our time to a service or to even give time to read and study our scriptures. Those are all giving of time to something else, to something that's more important, to something we're called to do. And when we all do that, and if we all do what we're supposed to do and make the sacrifices we're supposed to, then there won't be any differences that divide us. It doesn't mean we're giving, getting rid of our individuality necessarily. It means that we all want the same thing so much that we do things the same way. We follow the two greatest commandments of loving God and loving our neighbor. And when we do those things, we're all heading towards the same goal, or we should be. And I just liked how that tied in. He was talking about how we all have to make our own choices and sacrifice and whatever that means. And it's not always a huge sacrifice, but it needs to mean something. It needs, if it doesn't mean anything, if you're not giving up something, then it's not a sacrifice. That's, I mean, that's the bottom line. If you, if you don't feel like you're giving something, then I don't think you're, you're do, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're doing it right. And I hope that we've all, at, at the very least, picked that up over the last couple months when we've been going over this. And I hope that, uh, I hope that as these continue and the themes continue and we continue going through the, the symbolic cycle of going to the, through the tabernacle, that we can continue to learn together and pick up these things. So that's what I have. The brethren, please come forward to collect our offering this morning. Seems as though we should be able to collect the offering after today without any words of encouragement, but I'm. Uh, going to share something with you. This is my prayer for you today. Give your best to the master. Give him first place in your heart. Give him first place in your service. Consecrate every part. Give and to you shall be given. God, his beloved son, gave, gratefully seeking to serve him. Give him the best that you have. And what drives us to give our best to the master? The greatest gift we can give is a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And when we have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, our gifts are given in righteousness. Will you please pray with me? Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, 
We are truly grateful for this opportunity to share with you our gifts and our talents and our monies for the furthering of the work of the church. Father, it is my prayer this day that those who give might be blessed with great abundance and that the gifts might be able to grow and to serve the needs of those who need them. And I would pray, Father, that you would bless the hands that deal with these monies, that they might have wisdom beyond the wisdom of Solomon, that they might be guided by your Holy Spirit, that the work of your kingdom might come forth, that this, these gifts might be able to expediate that kingdom of yours. And these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, at this time I would seek your benediction upon this service, Father. And Father, we would seek your guidance and direction in our lives as we uh, long to consecrate our whole selves to thee in thy service. Be with us until we meet again, Lord. Praise be to thee for all that we have done this day. Protect us from harm and danger, Father, and thank you for loving us and watching over us. And these things I pray in Jesus' most holy name. Amen.